Hi everyone and welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Kira, and I'm the Digital Events Manager at Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand. Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand are part of the Info Exchange Group, a not-for-profit social enterprise that tackles the biggest social challenges through the smart and creative use of technology. For those of you who haven't attended a webinar session with us before, Connecting Up and TechSoup facilitates an annual training calendar of online webinars, workshops, boot camps and web cons that help the social sector upskill in all things digital. You should check out our training and education menu on our website for more events that we have coming up online. But enough about that, I'm excited to welcome you today to end of year management reports with Mick Devine, the CEO of Collexa Australia. And joining him today in the panel, we have Pam Chilman, who's an accounting consultant for Poetry Numbers. Mick is a CPA and CPO of Collexa Australia. He's been involved in accounting systems for non-for-profits since before the implementation of GST in Australia and has spent most of the past 20 years designing and developing tools to take time out of the budgeting and reporting process. His reward winning application is available as a donation through our Connecting Up and Texty websites. Pam is accredited in a number of financial systems and in particular Myob. Having been one of the first Myob certified consultants in Australia, he had a spot on the Myob partner advisor team and in 2016, she was rewarded the Myob Lifetime Achievement Award. Having recently left an accounting firm, she now consults as poetry numbers located in the northern New South Wales region of Balma. Little bit of housekeeping for everyone. All your lines are muted, so if any technical issues, please type it into the questions box on your webinar panel and I'll be able to assist you. If you have any questions during the session, please type these in the question box also and our panel will answer them in a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. We really encourage you to ask as many questions as you think throughout the session to make this as dynamic and interactive as possible. No question is too silly, but also note your comments and questions will not appear to the entire group. If you have a Wi-Fi connection and have multiple programs open, this can sometimes affect the quality of the audio and video of the webinar. And if possible, please close all other programs to help you have the best experience. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording and the slides will be sent to you as soon as we can after this webinar ends. Before we start, I'd also like to remind you that there's a short survey at the end of the webinar. And if you kindly could take the time to fill this out, we would really appreciate it. Thanks for attending today and I'll hand you over to Mick. Thanks, Kira, And good morning, everybody, or good afternoon to those of you in New Zealand and who knows what time of the day for those of you watching the recording. Anyway, so the the topic today is end of year reporting, and we're gonna have a look at some ideas on reports to present to, to management, to boards, and have a talk through those, give you some ideas on how to, what what sort of information to put together why people use some particular types of reports, why people use others. Um, and I guess the general focus of end of year reporting tends to be a combination of looking back at the past and and analyzing, you know, how well did we do? Did we achieve the goals that we set out to do? Did we achieve what we wanted to do, what worked well, what didn't work so well. And then looking ahead to the next year, what's our budget that we've got for the next year? What's our cash flow looking like? What's happening with our strategy over the next 12 months? And that sort of thing. So it's the combination of the two of those that probably makes end of year reporting a little bit different from just normal month end reporting. I mean, some of this stuff is pretty much the same as you would do at any month end, but sometimes the, the perspective changes a little bit. So I'm going to talk about some different ideas on reporting, some of the things that are worth looking at, and then I'll show you some examples towards the end. And the, the examples I've got are are produced in Calxa, but it's the important thing today is the general principles. It doesn't matter whether you're using Calxa or you're doing things with a spreadsheet or you're 
doing things with a pen and a bit of paper if you really want to. Um, the important thing is the, the, the content, what sort of information you're presenting, how you're presenting it. So if I'm preparing reports for a board, for example, at the end of the year and we're looking back and we're looking at our income and our expenses, probably the first thing I would do is present some sort of comparison to budget. You know, did we spend, you know, especially a not-for-profit organization that's grant funded, did we spend all of that grant money? Um, how close did we come to spending it all? What happens to the unspent amounts? Um, other things that we could do better in that area next year? And where were the big variances in those actuals against budget? And some of that, I think you want to look at the budget that you set at the beginning of the year, the, the approved budget that gets ticked off by the board. You know, how, how did our expectations change over the year? And how did we, um, how do we manage that? Did we have an adjusted budget, a, a forecast that we adjusted during the year? And then you probably want to compare actuals for the year with your original budget and with the adjusted budget. So to look at that, to look at how those have changed so that the board can see how decisions were made and and what the effect of those were. And then ultimately the the purpose of looking at any of these reports is to think about what do you need to do differently next year? You know, is there something you could could have done last year that would have helped you predict some of those changes during the year so that you could have planned for them, could have budgeted for them? Or were they totally unexpected and 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 nobody could have um, predicted them a year ago, you know. And sometimes that happens on the on the positive side, where halfway through the year you're presented with an opportunity to maybe apply for some different funding that was, didn't even exist at the beginning of the year, you know. Elections of various kinds are often a, a a good prompt for governments to start coming up with ideas on how to fund different sectors and that sort of thing. And and so there could be opportunities that just weren't there at the beginning of the year that you needed to put some effort into so that you help with the sustainability of the organization going forward, that sort of thing. And then I would also include some sort of KPI reporting. It's often you're reporting to people with a non-financial background. They don't necessarily understand all the ins and outs of a, a profit and loss statement or a balance sheet. They sometimes glaze over if you present them with too much detail. So I, I would keep a lot of the reporting high level, but there are some KPIs that are important to each organization, and that will vary depending on the type of organization you are. You know, for some people, it might be, you know, the 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 number of meals you served or the number of um, carer hours that you organized, or, you know, there'll be different things that tell you how how you're achieving your objectives as an organization. So it's important to track those and present them. And they're the sort of things that are easy to present as a chart or to include in a report with numbers. And then while I would, you know, do, you know, on that actual to budget side of things, for example, I would show the budget for 12 months and the actuals for 12 months and see how they look. I think it's also important to look at some of the detail as well. You know, were there trends? You know, so I do a report that has 
starts in July, ends in June, depending on what your financial year is. Those of you in New Zealand, it will be different. Um, but then having a look at the trends over that period, you know, did your income go up or down? Did wages go up or down over the month? Were there other costs that are rising towards the end of the year that you need to factor into your budgets and your planning for next year? And so it's having a look at those, having a look at the seasonal issues, you know, is there always a cash flow crisis around Christmas because, you know, there's lots of work to do and not much funding or something, um, you know, those things will be different for each organization, but it's about looking at that year as a whole, looking for the patterns in it that will give you insights that will help you do things better next year. And then, as well as comparing actuals to budget, how well did you do compared to the previous year? You know, look back at the previous year. Did things go better? Did you, you know, were you, was your cash balance better at the end of the year? Was your income higher? Um, did you ha grow your team? Those sort of things. So look at what's happened year on year, also compared to budget. And then the balance sheet side of things is is one that I think I think the not for profit sector is getting better at over the years, much better than they were 20 years ago. Um, people would generally just glaze over in those days if you talk to them about balance sheets. Um, but even the most non-financially literate board member can understand a bank balance. But I think it's not just the bank balance that's important, but how long is it going to last you? So it's about looking at that bank balance in, con in conjunction with your daily expenditure, either looking back or looking forward, so you know how many days of cash reserves you have. And, you know, it's, you know, there's a general rule of thumb that 90 days is fairly good, um, anything less than 30 days and you're, you know, treading on thin ice. And I think the pandemic a couple of years ago showed that what was once a fairly theoretical discussion about the need to keep those cash reserves became critical for many organizations where there was a sudden drying up of income, which we now know can happen and can happen unexpectedly. So it, you know, have you built up those cash reserves compared to the previous year or have you run them down because, you know, there were hard times in your sector? And then the balance sheet, I find balance sheet reporting works well if you compare it to something else. If you show somebody who's not an accountant a balance sheet, they won't really know what to do with it. But if you show them the balance sheet compared to the previous year, for example, then they'll start understanding that the assets have increased, the liabilities have increased or decreased, that the credit card balance has increased or decreased, the, the bank account has increased or decreased. They'll be able to see those changes and that will make sense to them. Um, and they'll understand why that's important then. And then it's some of those more um, detailed items like, are the suppliers getting paid? You know, is, is there a blowout in your creditor days, KPI, for example? Um, is the GST and super getting paid on time? Or is there a buildup of a balance there? because these are signs of 
future cash problems that a board needs to know about because they have that duty of care for making sure the organization's not insolvent. And I guess the other thing with with the balance sheet is it's sometimes a place with odd and peculiar things get hidden. Um, sometimes they're they're general genuinely there because they're odd and peculiar. Um, sometimes people will hide things there. But and then when you're reviewing the details on the expense side of things, it's about looking at the most important ones. You know, it doesn't matter most of the time how much you're spending on, you know, telephone expenses. I mean, and, and again, I give that example, it will vary from organization to organization. Um, certainly probably doesn't matter how much you're spending on postage stamps these days, but there are big expenses like um, wages, you know, we we operate in a service industry. Wages is the biggest expense for most not-for-profit organizations. Is that being managed well? How does it compare to last year? How does it compare to budget? Um, were there unexpected on costs? And, <coughs> excuse me, and then beyond wages, it will depend a lot on what sort of organization you're in, you know, um, in some, there'll be, you know, big expenditure on um, the premises that you're operating from. In some, there'll be um, cars and vehicles. In some, there'll be, you know, stage equipment or something like that. So, but have a look at those big expenses and present those to the board, to your management. And, you know, it's about working out what's appropriate for each level within, within the organization. Looking at what do the board need to do their job to look at the strategy, to look at the, the general direction of the business, to look at whether we're still going to be sustainable and continue next year. Whereas a department manager for their end of year reports wants the finer detail on their departments, their programs, etc. Um, so, and talking of programs, um, you know, programs, projects, jobs, departments, you know, most organizations in the not-for-profit sector have some level of complexity that requires management at more than just a global level. Um, so I think it's about summarizing that information for boards and senior managers. So maybe they get one line for each project that just tells them um, budget actual variance for the income, profit and loss, um, income expenses and profit, for example, so they can see whether they ended the year on track or not on track, and then they can ask for more detail if they need it on any of the problem areas, or you provide that as part of the commentary on the reports when you present them. And But for the actual program managers, they want the detail. They want to know line by line where their income came from, how it compared to budget, where their expenses went, how they compared to budget. So it, it's about producing the right reports for the right people. And they could be the same reports, just run at different levels. So that's just a KPI report. And then, as I said, part of the end of year reporting process is about looking back at the past and part of it's looking forward to the future. So again, it's those budgets for the next year and 
when you're reporting on next year's budgets, there are, there are valid questions about what's the right level of detail for each audience. And again, I think summarize for boards, summarize for senior managers, detail for the departmental program manager people further down in the organization. And I would present those budgets for next year and provide a comparison to either the budget for the year just finished or the actuals for the year just finished. Again, so they've got some context. You know, if somebody just gives you a budget, you know, you turn up for a board meeting once a month at this organization and someone gives you a budget that says, our income is going to be a million dollars, our expenses are going to be $950,000, surplus at the end of the year of $50,000. You say that, that sounds great on its own, but it wants that context of, okay, last year our income was $2 million, so why is it only going to be $1 million this year? Or last year it was 500000 how are we going to double it this year? You know, those are relevant questions and that context is important to understanding the information. So sometimes you need to present that same information in different ways to help people understand it fully. And, you know, it may, may be that the board wants to see, you know, the budget for this year compared to the budget for last year and the actuals for last year as well. Um, different boards will have different levels of involvement, different skill sets, and and sometimes the treasurer and the and the chairman of the board may want slightly more detailed information than everybody else. But everybody should get the basic information so they know what's happening and they can make decisions on what the organization needs at a high level. And then again, I would encourage people to look at a cash flow forecast, because if you're not forecasting cash flow, how do you know that your organization's solvent and can pay its bills as and when they're due? You know, I many, many years ago, I talked to a, um, um, a finance manager at a not-for-profit organization who shall remain nameless. Um, but he said, we've got $2 million in the bank. We don't need to do a cash flow forecast. Now, he was probably right in that their annual expenditure was generally less than $2 million. So it was highly unlikely that they were going to um, go bankrupt, even if they didn't get the income they expected. But most of us don't have the luxury of $2 million just sitting idle in the bank. Um, so we do need to forecast our cash flow. And I think it's also important to forecast the balance sheet because that gives you the, the context and the, the check on the cash flow and whether it's sensible. That profit and loss budget, the cash flow forecast, the balance sheet budget should all work together and should all be matching and consistent. And um, I think my experience is that that's gaining in, um, it's going to say popularity, but, but certainly we see it more often in the not-for-profit profit sector these days, um, certainly much more than they used to. But um, there are still many organizations who don't do a cash flow forecast, don't do a balance sheet forecast, and partly because it's hard. And I understand that if you're doing this stuff on a spreadsheet, it is hard work. But there are tools out there that can make it easier for you. Um, that's just the cash flow forecast chart out of Calxa. You know, if, if you're a board member and you see something like that, you can look at that and you can say, okay. Our income over the year, it's it's increasing slightly. It's well above zero, showing no signs of going towards zero at any point during the year. 
I don't have to lose sleep over that. I can tick that box and say, I've looked at the cash flow forecast. I can sign that bit of paper when I send it off to the ACNC saying, yes, we're a going concern. We're not likely to be insolvent in the next 12 months. And so it, I'll talk a little bit about Calxa and I'll show you some examples um, of, of some reports out of Calxa in a, in a moment. But the, the idea in Calxa is we connect to your accounting system with that zero MYOB or QuickBooks, or we can also manage um, other systems through uh, an Excel import. Not quite as smooth, but once you've set it up, it works quite well. And then we have a lot of report templates and lots of choices about what you put on them. But once you've figured out what reports you, you need, the idea is that you put them together into a bundle that saves all the configuration and settings. And then next year, you just run that same bundle again. And, you know, times may have changed. You may decide that, you know, a certain KPI that was important last year isn't so important this year, something else is. Um, there's another report that you've come across that you find tells the story a bit better. You swap things in and out, but you've got the basic structure there. And once you've set it up, it's easy to generate each each year. So might take you in and give you a look at what sort of um, what sort of reports that you can get out of Calxa. And as I as I said earlier, I, I'm not saying this because you have to use Calxa to do these reports. You can do them in a spreadsheet. It'll just take you a little bit longer, but if you've if you've got the time and the skills to use a spreadsheet and you like using spreadsheets, don't let me stop you. So um, in my end of year sample reports here, I've got a cover page on there. And then I've got my budget analysis report for the year where I'm showing that just the full year actuals compared to budget and a dollar variance and a percentage variance. Um, my sample data has got some fairly odd numbers in it from time to time, but, um, and in Calxa, we, we pull out the chart of accounts from your accounting system, but you can group and summarize things in different ways, depending on how you need for a particular audience. So in this case, I've got headings for product sales and grant funding. I've got some cost of goods sold. I've separated out my direct wages and I've got a contribution margin after my um, gross profit and then my expenses followed by my operating profit. So it's it's not really rocket science. It's just grouping and arranging those accounts, but it's can be hard work to manage in a spreadsheet. And then, so so that was actuals compared to budget. And this one is actuals compared to the previous year. Again, gives a different perspective to help people understand how the, how the organization has gone, what's worked well, what's not so well, yeah. And then I've added some KPIs on the bottom here of admin to revenue and wages to turnover. And then looking at the last year, month by month, again, so we can see those trends. You know, in this case, our income is fairly stable across the whole year. And that's the total, the act, total for the year compared to the original budget and then the variance from that. But it just helps to look at this. Um, and, you know, in this case, I am looking at a fairly high level. I've summarized all my admin, I've summarized my marketing, my operations. But if I was presenting this report to a program manager, I would include all the detail lines so they can see, you know, 
how much of the wages is wages, how much is superannuation, how much is work cover, etc. Yeah, because they need to know that. The CEO, the board members, they probably don't need that level of detail. So it's getting the right level of detail for, for each person that you're sending it to. And then balance sheet, as I said, give it some context. And the simplest context is comparing it to last year. And you know, some of these reports, depending on the accounting system you're using, you may be able to get out of the accounting system. Um, <laughs> excuse me, budgeting in some accounting systems is a bit easier than others. Um, none, of, none of them are perfect, but um, you, you can do it. And, and a lot of the basic reports you can get from the, <laughs> excuse me, accounting systems. And, you know, with something like MYOB or QuickBooks, you can have header accounts and they will do that grouping for you. You only get one one set of groups, but sometimes that's enough. So depending on the complexity of your organization, the size of it, etc. Yeah. So again, actual budget, oh, sorry, actual last year and the variance. So you can see where those changes have happened. The where did our money go report is one we put together to try and help non-accountants understand the connection between the net profit or surplus that you've made for the year, and you can change that terminology in Calxa, um, and the movement in the bank account. So in this case, we've made a surplus of 107,000, but the bank's only increased by 70,000. Why is that? mostly because we've paid off a chunk of GST, we haven't collected all our receivables, and we've partly funded it by not paying all our super. So it's it's showing you the balance sheet movements, but trying to make it understandable to a non-accountant. And the bank movements chart, is starts off with the opening bank and then it's showing what where our money's coming in from so product sales grant funding um we've got a little bit of cost of goods sold there then the biggest outgoing is our wages admin office marketing operations a few other things tax and super payables and then we get to the closing bank which you'll see is slightly more than the opening bank at the beginning of the year so it's about presenting this information in a way that helps people understand it, see the connections between things without overwhelming them with details. And similarly, breakdown of our expenses, um, just by these simple headings. So you can just have a quick glance at, you know, what was making up most of it. So. You know, there were some months where operations was high, some where it was low. The office expenses were fairly standard, except for a couple of months, those sort of things. So you can see um, what the seasonal variations were in those. You know, we didn't spend anything on marketing in March, for example, and not much in February. Program summary. So this is. Um, just one of those summary reports we have where we've got one line for each job tracking category, class, um, program projects, whatever you call them, just showing income, expense, profit, budget and actual for the month and for the year to date. So in terms of the end of year reporting, it's this part over the right hand side that's most important. And, you know, I'd be looking at this profit figure here, comparing to what we budgeted, was it better, was it worse? Um, is there anything I need to ask for more detail on? But I can have a quick glance at that list of programs and see which ones finished on track, which ones didn't, without having to 
wade through a detailed profit and loss on every single one of them. So it's about summarizing that information for the people who only need summary information. You know, this wouldn't be terribly useful to the manager of that program because they want the detail, but for the board member, the CEO, it's a good starting point. And then again, the overview of you know, the impact of different programs um, on the organization. You know, in this case, I'm looking at the, the income for each program. You know, so most of it's coming from Self-Defense Commonwealth um, and then Self-Defense Queensland, et cetera. And so you can see who are the big contributors and how that's made up. And you can do that for income, you can do that for expenses, you could do it for wages. You know, it'll depend on the type of organization and what, you know, are there particular areas that as an organization you're focusing on trying to manage better. And the other thing I think the end of year reporting is good for is taking a bit of a longer term view. And that's why I, I like to include a five year review. Or sometimes even a 10-year review if you've got 10 years of data. Um, and in this case, I've I've picked up the last four years of actuals and the forecast for the next year. So again, it's giving context to that forecast for the next year. It's showing where we've come from over the last few years, all on one page, so that you can see, you know there's been growth, there may have been dips during the pandemic, um, things may have got better as we came out of the pandemic, they may not have, but that's the information that you need to provide to the board, to the senior managers, so that they can understand what's happening in the organisation. And, you know, boards, senior managers, they're the ones who need to take that long-term view. You don't expect it so much from a person who's one, running one small program. They're in the day-to-day, week-to-week, making sure the thing happens. They're not looking so much at the big picture. It's nice when they do, but um, it's not, not their main focus. So again, the, the cash flow forecast chart showing whether or not we're insolvent, whether we've got cash flow problems. You know, some organizations in some sectors are very seasonal. You know, there are times when um, there are greater demands on your services, times when there are lower demands, and times when you've got higher expenses and maybe lower income, and the income catches up at another time. So, you know, or you're getting grants in at the beginning of the year that need to be spread out over the rest of the year before the next lot comes in. And maybe the bank balance goes really low before the next lot of grants come in. Um, but it's knowing when those dips are happening that allows you to manage it and say, okay, let's have a meeting of the finance committee. And, you know, if this was showing a, a big dip in February, March 24, we could have a discussion now about, you know, what do we need to do to manage that? Is it about deferring some expenditure? Can we um, get some income brought in sooner? Those sort of things. And as I said, the balance sheet forecast starts off with the balance sheet as it is now and I usually suggest to people that they look at the start by looking at the ending and the opening balances um, in this case it's my transaction bank accounts are going to drop from 457 to 235,000 over the next 12 months is that reasonable depend you know based on um, everything else that we've forecast. Does that make sense? You know, um, 
our debtors are going from 60,000 to 183,000. You know, is that because we're going to be, um, we're expecting to increase our income, therefore we'll be invoicing more people, or are we planning to change our credit terms so that more people will be on longer terms? Or, you know, what's the reason for that? Those, those are the questions to ask, you know. Um, we're obviously buying some non-current assets here. Is that the reason for the drop in the bank account? Um, it's it's about looking at the end compared to the beginning, and then looking at the trends in between that makes that balance sheet forecast important. And then, as I said, next year's budget. At the board level, they may just be satisfied with the, especially if they've been through the budgeting process and signed off on the budget already. But, you know, in July, you can give them the report that compares the new budget against the full year actuals for last year. So they can again remind themselves of what they've signed off on, how that compares to what we did last year. You know, it's a it's a one more opportunity to say, okay, maybe we need to rethink some of that. Um, but it's it's giving them that information in some context. So what I want to do now is, um, as Kira said, we've got Pam Chilman joining us, and she's just going to spend a few minutes giving you some general tips on, you know, she's particularly an expert in MYB and and zero, but a lot of what she's got to say, I think, will be a appropriate to anybody using any accounting system. So Kira, can you hand over to Pam for a few minutes, please? Thanks, Mick. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. And um, thank you for the opportunity to join you and picking up on Mick's comments about looking backwards and looking forward. I'm going to bring up some tips for you about uh, the year ahead and uh, particularly as the majority of our clients use CalCSA, it's a great tool to um, produce the budgets for the coming years and the cash flow projections. And I love how it seamlessly connects with, as Mick said, uh, with Zero, MYOB and QuickBooks. So uh, I thought I'd pick up on the comments Mick made earlier on about the labour costs and wages being one of the biggest line items for many in the not-for-profit sector. And when you're looking at your budgets coming up, remember that superannuation is one of those costs that's increasing from the 1st of July to the 11% rate. So keep that in mind, and maybe many of you have already considered this, but when you're looking ahead at your budgets, the rate is increasing to 11% from when you do your first pay runs in July. Now remember that rate is increasing from the date of the payment, not the period of time that it relates to. So it's from that first pay run actually paid in July, not for the period of time that it refers to. And a little tip for you as well, um, in your accounting software also, there are some tools now that will allow you to, instead of manually increasing the rate each time, your accounting software has, depending on which product you're using, it has a setting, and the one I'm showing you on the screen is uh, where you can say it's a statutory rate. So many of us in the past have had it on percentage of earnings, and every year we've had to go in and change it to 9.5, 10, 10.5, and now 11. So save yourself some time each year, and in zero it's called the statutory rate, in MYB it's called the minimum required rate. And that'll look to, in, in uh, and also in QuickBooks as well, and that means that the software will do the work for you, and it'll apply the increase of rate from the date of the next pay run in July. A bit of a theme to do with superannuation as it is a bit of a cost for us all. So again, um, I guess a time-saving tip is about making use of that automated payment of superannuation feature. If you're not already using it, your software is great to be able to do that. Fast approaching our, um, our, our timeframes to do with paying of our super, but in light of looking ahead at our budgets, I just wanted to bring to your attention that as we've paid in the past, uh, from a cash flow and budgeting perspective, 
talked about the rate increase. From a cash flow perspective, at the moment we're required to pay our superannuation minimum of a quarterly time period from the ATO. And that's the minimum legislated with the, with the Australian Taxation Office. Did you know though that from 1st of July 2026, it's proposed that employers will be required to pay their super, superannuation at the same time salary and wages is paid. And according to the ATO, this should help address the $5 billion a year of unpaid super and also make it easier for the employees to keep track of their payments. So there is in Calxa that wonderful feature that allows you to do multiple budget versions and different scenarios. And it, there's some great tools in Calxa that will assist you in not only addressing the um, different budget versions with the different rate increases, because the superannuation rate is increasing half a percent each year until it gets to the 12% um, rate, I think in 2026 as well. So watch out for those changes and the impacts on your budgets. A couple of other considerations with an impact on your budget as well, and no doubt this is on your radar already, uh, fast approaching with 1st of July. Uh, many of you will have heard in the media about the award wage increases of a minimum of 5.75% to the minim national minimum wage. So it's increasing to 880 per week or 23.23 per hour. And this applies from the first full pay period starting after the 1st of July. So it means if your first pay in July starts on Monday, uh, Monday week, uh, the 3rd, then that's when the new rates will apply. Now, no doubt that you have been looking on the Fair Work Ombudsman website, but they're currently working on the updates to the pay tools and the information with the new rates, and, we're, and they've indicated they'll be ready on the 1st of July. So 1st of July is a Saturday, so somehow we're going to need to be ready for pays on the Monday, the 3rd, when the rates increase. So uh, a little bit of last minute up there. So keep an eye on the tools on the website. You can subscribe, and many of you no doubt subscribe to the Fair Work website emails. If you haven't, then I encourage you to do that and you'll be able to get those emails automatically from Fair Work when those award um, information and the rates are up on their site. Um, as Mick mentioned, I work with a number of accounting systems. I'm certified, I know that's a good word, I was certified in MYB, accredited in Xero and QuickBooks, working with all of those three products as well as extensively with Calxa. And one of the things that I love about Calxa is that you can really automate the way you set your budgets. So rather than starting with a blank piece of paper, if this year coming up is gonna be similar to say, I don't know, maybe five years ago and you've got your budgets in the system, then you can automate setting of your budgets for future years based on past years very easily. There's some great tools, um, being able to copy the budgets, some wizards, and certainly saves you a lot of time rather than starting with that blank piece of paper. And then you can still modify and edit those budgets very easily to adapt to whatever is coming up with your projections in the coming year. So to, um, and of course, making sure that your accounting software balances are correct because your accounting software is the foundation for the actuals. So as we always say in finance, garbage in, garbage out. So you want the quality of the data to be there with your accounting software, because that flows very seamlessly through to your Calxa reporting. And as we say, um, Calxa takes your reporting to the next level because it gives you the, the, uh, far more reports and far more functionality than your accounting software does. And it may be an opportune time to review the structure of your accounting software, maybe a chart of accounts, the use of tracking categories or classes or jobs, depending on which accounting software you're using. Um, I visited a, visited a client yesterday and they've got such a long chart of accounts, it's actually become unwielding. So we're looking to revamp that structure and make better use of tracking categories and the classes and locations, depending on the terminology you're used to. And that will ensure that that flows through to Calxa smoothly. 
But if not, there are some great tools in Calxa as well that can really uh, that can modify the order and the view in which you present your information, particularly for acquittals when your structure is not designed the same way as your acquittal reporting. So um, some tips for you to think about whether you make use of them in your accounting software or use the tools in Calxa. So it gives you that extra flexibility. And just to finish on my tips and considerations for the future for the year, um, I do always like to remind users about the locked feature. And that's to ensure that in your accounting system, the data doesn't change. And also within Calxa, there is a locked setting as well to make sure your budgets don't accidentally change, particularly once they've been approved by the board. You can go in and unlock in both of your systems, but you don't want to accidentally make those changes or have other users accidentally make those changes and then wonder why your reporting is not as, as is expected or hasn't flowed through correctly from prior years. And at this time of year, if you haven't already, the great thing is you can invite your auditor or your advisor in for some support at end of financial year or in fact throughout the year. And what I love about Calxa is that you can also invite in your program managers and they can access just their budgets rather than if you invite them into your accounting software where they can also see everybody else's budgets as well. So the nice thing in Calxa is you can limit their view and it means that they can be managing just their particular uh, funding or um, monies to do with their program. So think about to who you've got giving access to in Calxa because that might mean that you can, um, if you've been using it for a little while, maybe start getting others involved as well. So that was just a very few quick tips and um, just some information about me in case you're wanting to keep in touch. As Mick said, I'm a long-standing Calxa pa uh, partner working with a range of accounting systems. And um, if you're looking for some tips or some checklists, I've got um, one that I've just updated on the end of year. Um, so my contact details are on there. Otherwise, back to you, Mick, for your handy tips and tricks. I think you you undersell that Calxa product, you know. It's got some great features and you've only shown a very small amount of some of those reports. There's so many more reports you can get in those bundles. Uh, so, thank you, Pam. Um, <laughs> My, my my objective today wasn't to wasn't to sell Calxa, and uh, that wasn't why I invited Pam along either, everybody. But um, um, I'm 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 happy to be flattered. Um, what we Great should product. do now, though, is come back to you, the audience, and Kira. Do we have some questions from anybody? Yes, we do, Mick. Uh, let me see, we've got one here from Charlotte. In New Zealand, we now have to provide a statement of service performance with our annual reports. Does CLEXA have any templates for this type of report that is more about KPI measures rather than financial reporting? Um, I'm going to have to Google statement of service performance after I've finished, um, but I would be happy to come back to you offline on that one, Charlotte. If you can um, email me at mick at calxa.com, but, and um, Kira will send the slides and um, that sample report bundle, which will have my contact details, but I, I will say in general, I think we probably can. We've got a number of reports where you can include KPIs, either as you know, table of numbers showing actuals budget or a trend, or as charts. So I'm 95% certain we'll be able to do something that comes very close to what you want for that statement of service performance. Um, but I will educate myself and be Better no, I'll, I'll know more by the time we come to next year's reporting webinar. But I will find out very quickly for you. I'll um, one one of my colleagues is New Zealand based. I'll ask her; she'll know. Excellent. Uh, I've got another question here from Glenn. I have to correct the wage increase comment for Pam. Ooh, the award minimum rates are increasing by five point seven five percent. 
the national minimum wage is increasing from 812 and 60 cent to 882 and 80 cents which is an increase of 8.6 percent that's one for pat who's offline from glenn so what was the uh, actual question uh he just wanted to say that i have to correct the wage increase comments uh the award minimum rates are increasing by 5.75 percent the national minimum wage is increasing from $812.60 to $882.80, which is an increase of 8.6%. Okay, noted. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I guess people on the minimum rate are getting a, a higher increase than those on other award rates. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And uh, okay, so uh, Pam mentioned full pay period after July 1st and said that this would be in effect on July 3rd, but this would not be a full pay period as it would include June's pay dates. Would it not mean a full pay period from July 1st to July 14th as an example? So it's from the full pay period from whenever your full, first full pay period is in July. Okay. Yep. So it would be that one starting on July the 3rd, not the one that's paid on July the 3rd in your example, wouldn't it? Yeah. 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 Yes. Full being uh, the operative word. Yeah. 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 Uh, has anyone else got any more questions for Mick or Pam uh, before we conclude today? You obviously covered everything that everyone needed to know guys which is amazing oh, or totally well, confused them yes exactly. <laughs> Julie would like to know can the secret be paid with pays right now or will it come into effect only uh, in 2026 sorry i can't hear very well today say again can the super be paid with pays right now or will it come into effect only in 2026 so you can pay your superannuation now when you pay your wages. You can choose to pay earlier, but the proposed legislation is that from 2026 that that will be required of all employers. The legislation hasn't been passed. It's certainly something that's got support, but it hasn't been passed as yet. There's a lot of discussion around it, so that may well change, but that's proposed from the 2026-27 financial year, payroll year. Excellent. Um, I don't think we have any more questions, guys. I think uh, everyone has answered any last minute questions. Uh, while I'm just waiting, I just would like to take a chance to say thank you to you both for coming along today. Um, end of year reporting, I know, can be a big thing. Sometimes goes over my head, but uh, very interesting for a lot of people out there who's into their numbers. And then um, you guys have been a great help, and we'll definitely do something like this again at the end of the year and possibly throughout the year as well, just to make sure everyone, everyone's up to date. And um, as I mentioned, there will be a recording and any slides uh, uploaded will upload it to our website, and there'll be a link provided. Uh, and I also include Mick and Pam's contact details in an email that I will send out to everyone. So if you want to contact Mick or Pam directly afterwards for any more questions, um, please do so. These guys are great. They've been uh, great with us here at Connecting Up at TechSoup. Uh, they're great supporters and uh, we love having you here. So, uh, oh, a few more questions, guys. Are you all right to hold on for a few seconds? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mick, uh, can Mick indicate where we will find the five-year report he discussed? Ah, if you're a Calxa user, it's the PL with projected total. Um, have I reports builder PL with projected total? There is a five year option there. And I customized the start. So rather than starting the current financial year, I went minus 48 to start on July 2019. Something like that. Perfect. 
Perfect. That will make sense to anybody as a Calxi user already. May not make so much sense to somebody who's not, then, but. Uh, we had Kate just wanted a quick question. Is there a Claxa uh, demo on the TechSoup website? The, there'll be a link there, yep. but if you go to calxa.com, there are free trial buttons all over the place. And if you go to customers and not for profits, there's a book a demo option there where you can book a Zoom session and one of our team will have a talk to you, show you around, make sure it will do what you want it to do and go from there. Yeah. So if you're happy to just jump in on the 30 day trial, do that. It'll step you through connecting to your Zero or MYB or whatever. Um, if you want to find out some more information first, feel free to book the demo and we'll give you the guided tour and answer your questions. You know, some Excellent. people have complex questions, some people have simple setups. Yeah, but we'll help you. Perfect. All right, guys, I think that's it for today. So, yes, thank you very much. And as I said, we'll have a recording up on the web page and I'll have everyone's email addresses in the body of the email. So get in contact with the guys and uh, thank you guys for coming along today. Okay, thanks Kira. Perfect, talk thanks, to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.